Hey guys, today we'll be looking at a cheap and easy way to add 10 gigabit support to your home network. The age of fiber to the home is here and it's expanding rapidly. Many ISPs are now offering support for one, two, five gigabits per second at affordable prices. Now, yes, most devices and people won't need more than your typical one gig over twisted pair, uh, Cat 5e or Cat 6 cable. However, if you're like me, you probably have several devices in your home that would benefit from a higher bandwidth connection, not only for internet access, but also for general internal use. This is the CRS 309 1G 8S Plus IN Cloud Router Switch from Microtik. So we have the CRS, which stands for Cloud Router Switch. The 3 represents Series 3. The 09 represents 9 wired network interface ports. 1G is 1 gigabit port. 8S Plus is 8 SFP Plus ports. And the IN means it's an indoor use chassis or a uh, desktop type chassis. So obviously these are the 8 SFP Plus ports. This is our one gigabit port. It's intended for management use, like if you have a dedicated management VLAN. Uh, this also supports PoE in, so you can power this whole switch using 802.3 AT or PoE plus. It can be used for semi-redundancy. However, it's not true redundancy, meaning it can't switch between power sources without rebooting or causing a brief service interruption. We also have an RS-232 console port, a reset button, and a couple of status LEDs. On the back, we have a large aluminum heatsink. This device is entirely passively cooled. That means there aren't any fans inside. This makes it a perfect switch where noise is a concern, such as at or under a workstation. We also have our DC input. It is 12 to 57 volts with a center positive pin. The CRS309 also includes rack gears for a standard 19 inch server rack or telecom rack. And obviously we have our AC power adapter. Under the hood we have a dual core 800 megahertz ARM CPU with 512 megabytes of RAM and 16 megabytes of flash storage. This is an affordable low power switch and that comes with a few trade-offs. The CRS309 supports both router OS and switch OS. However, it doesn't have the processing power to function as a router or a layer three device at a full 10 gigabit line speed. For that reason, I would plan to use this only as a layer two switch. I wouldn't plan to do any routing or any sort of layer three support on the device. Microtik does publish performance testing on their website of their switches. And if we look at the test results for the CRS309 here, we can see that in switching mode, layer two throughput, non-blocking throughput, was 79.9 gigabits per second at a standard packet size. If we go down to layer three support, uh, layer three basic bridging mode was at 2.6 gigabits per second and uh, layer three routing mode was at 2.5 gigabits per second. So while this does have layer three support and uh, router OS support, I would definitely stick to a layer two only use. And for that reason, I'll just be sticking to switch OS. I think it's a lot easier to use. Uh, when you don't need all of the multitude of millions of options that come packed in router OS, half of which or most of which don't even apply to the specific device you're working on. Next, let's take a look at the initial configuration and getting this set up. First, we'll connect the power and then we'll plug in a standard ethernet cable to the management interface. Now, most, if not all, Microtik switches will ship by default with an IP address of 192.168.88.1. So you'll need to set up an IP in that range on your computer to get the initial configuration done. So I'm gonna go to my uh, network settings here. We'll go to ethernet, IP assignment, we'll change it to manual, IPv4, we'll do 192.168.88.2. It's a 255.255.0 subnet, so it's a slash 24. 192.168.88.1 for the gateway, 192.168.88.1 for the DNS. Obviously those two settings don't matter since we're just connecting straight to the device, uh, but Windows will require you to input those. And then we should be able to navigate to 192.168.88.1 in your web browser, and you can see we're presented with a basic login page for router OS. The default username and password for Microtik products is admin, username, and a blank password, and just click login. So first we're going to set an IP address, and then we're going to tell it we want to boot in switch OS mode. To set your IP address, we'll go to system, and click on switch OS or SWOS. Uh, so by default it is set to DHCP, but typically you would give your switches and routers a static IP address, so we're going to change this to static, and we're going to do 192.168.0.3. We'll click apply. Now, router OS and switch OS are different configurations, so changes you make in one operating system will not be reflected in the other operating system. They are separate operating systems. However, router OS does include this single SWOS page, 
which allows you to set an IP address and some basic settings and save those to a SwitchOS configuration file. So now that we've set an IP address and we've applied those settings, we're going to go to uh, System here, expand System, and go to the Router Board tab. We'll click the Settings button, and we're going to change the Boot OS to Switch OS. We'll click Apply, and then we're going to go to System again, and click Reboot. To a ping 192.168.0.3, we need to move the networking cable from our management port over to our main home network. And after a bit of troubleshooting because I had the wrong port patched at the switch end, uh, we can see that our switch at 0.3 is now responding. So now we can navigate in the web browser to .0.3. And here's the MicroTik Switch OS. So we'll just do a quick run through the tabs here. We can see all nine interfaces, SFP plus one through eight, and then our ethernet or our management interface. We can select an interface speed, either auto negotiate, or we can set uh, 10 through 10 gig, 10 meg through 10 gig here. Under the SFP tab, we can see information about our transceivers. You can see I've plugged modules into interfaces two, three, and four. I'm using two Intel transceivers and then just this cheap Quiniac, whatever I got on Amazon. It's an 850 uh, nanometer multi-mode transceiver. We have the serial number, the manufacturer date, the type, uh, the temperature, which is nice to be able to watch the temperature of these transceivers just to make sure they're not getting too hot. Voltage, and then we have our transmit and receive power. I really like that you can see this much detail with these transceivers. Uh, port isolation, if you want to configure which ports are able to talk to which other ports. Uh, we have lags or link aggregate groups. Passive and active both support LACP. Static is obviously a static lag with no LACP. Uh, forwarding, if you want to control like multicast and broadcast traffic, you can also do port mirroring. Port mirroring is very handy if you need to run a packet capture or you know Wireshark, something like that. Rapid spanning tree, it does support spanning tree. It's enabled by default. Spanning tree is great for detecting the accidental network loops. Statistics, we have all kinds of statistics for each of the interfaces, packet rates, transmit rates, receive rates, broadcast, multicast, and so forth. Again, a very verbose output of all the types of errors. Uh, we have a histogram tab. To be completely honest, I'm not sure what the histogram tab is for. Um, we have a VLAN tab. You can enable, disable VLANs, have them optional, or you can use strict mode. Typically, you'll probably use strict mode. You can control whether you want to permit tagged VLANs, untagged VLANs, or any VLANs. This is where you'll set the default tag for untagged traffic. I can probably go on to an entire video of just VLAN management on a MicroTik switch. It's very unique as opposed to, you know, Aruba or Cisco styled switches. Uh, again, our VLAN tabs here where you would create your VLANs that you want to use on those interfaces. Uh, discovered host information, different MAC addresses. Supports SNMP if you want to use that. It supports ACLs if you want to use ACLs. And then our basic system settings where you can set an IP address, the identity of the router, which ports you can communicate with the web interface on. Your VLAN restrictions, these options are great if you want to lock down that ethernet port to only a dedicated management VLAN and you don't want that ethernet port talking to any of your other SFP plus ports. Uh, we have trusted ports for DHCP snooping if you want to do that for security as well, password, and then just some configuration backup. Lastly, we have an upgrade tab. This is where you can upgrade firmware if you download it from the MicroTik website. And I think that's pretty much all there is to see on the web interface. So by now the question you may have is why SFP plus and why not uh, RJ45 copper 10 gig ports? Well, 10 gig over a copper twisted pair is actually very expensive to do. I forget what the exact numbers are, but I think you can do like 150 feet or so over CAT, uh, CAT 6, and then your standard 328 feet, I think it is, over CAT 6A. In addition to that, the cabling is not too expensive, but the RJ45 SFP plus transceivers for 10 gig are expensive and they get very, very hot. The same with an RJ45 based 10 gig card for your computer, a PCIe expansion card. Again, they're expensive. You're probably talking 75 to 100 bucks minimum. They're very expensive. They run very hot. If you're adding some 10 gig ports and you have the ability to run new cabling, I would strongly recommend going the fiber route. You can pick up these 10 gig transceivers from Intel for very cheap, around eight to $10 a piece, even cheaper if you buy them in bulk packs. And then the SFP Plus cards I use for my computers and my servers are the Intel X520-DA2. It's a PCIe XA card. They are very cheap. They're very reliable. They work under pretty much any version of Linux. They still work in Windows 10. They work in Windows 11. So your 520 may run around 25 to 30 bucks used. You get two of these transceivers, that's another 20 bucks. You just need a stretch of fiber, and for in your own home, short runs, I would recommend Multimode OM3. It's the aqua jacketed fiber, 850 nanometers. You can get that for pretty cheap as well. Let's say another 20 or 30 bucks for a 50 foot run of cable. The CRS309 does support copper SFP plus modules for 
uh, 10 gig base T. However, because they get so hot and because this is passively cooled, they will, will overheat in this switch. I would not recommend putting 10 gig copper transceivers in here. You might be able to get away with one or two if you decide to try them. Uh, maybe try to stick them in every other port. Don't pack it full of them. Don't put two next to each other. And I'll be installing the switch near the top of the rack. Right about there seems like a good place. All right, so I have one of the Intel transceivers I'm going to use in the first slot. Uh, this port will end up being the trunk port. It's gonna pass my VLANs from my core switch, which is an HPE 292048G. And then I will use the native VLAN on this port for the management purposes. So I won't actually be connecting the management interface. The 2920 is a fairly dated switch at this point. It does have SFP plus ports via an expansion module in the rear. And then I'll be using a three foot OM3 patch cable here. Just plug one end into the rear of the switch. Then I'll pass that through one of the open keystone holes of the panel above and plug it into the transceiver. Now I did get the uh, link light, the activity light and the 10 gig light there. If I did not get the link light, there's a chance you may have to reverse uh, the two fibers here. Uh, basically the transmit from one has to go to the receive on the other one. Now, as you can see, I do have a keystone based patch panel at the top here and I have a few LC to LC modules. The original intent was to use this as sort of a fiber patch panel where the fiber would plug in the back of this. And then I'd just put like a small one foot patch from the front down to the actual fiber switch. Um, it seems a bit silly to do that. So I don't know if I'll actually do that or not versus just passing it through. That seems to work pretty well and it's less connections in the fiber, less potential for loss or problems down the road. So, and I've got one more to plug in for one of my home servers. Uh, so now I've got two 10 gig links connected and I have room for six more. All right, we're gonna call it quits here today. This is the Microtik CRS309. I think this is a perfect way to add 10 gigabit fiber support to your home network and make sure you're ready for when fiber to the home rolls out in your area. I think I paid around 240 for the switch. I actually purchased it back in June, so it's been a little while now. Um, I've been using it on and off and now I finally have it installed in my rack. If you have any questions or comments, or there's anything more you guys want to see, please do let me know. I may come back in a month or two here and do a video just on VLAN management of the switch because I think there's a lot you can say on that topic. Uh, it is a slightly unconventional way of managing VLANs and it takes a little bit, at least it took me a little bit to grasp. So yeah, hit that like button before you go and thanks for watching.